years. But these groups had been of the discussion group variety, where we would read book and, books and talk about men's issues. Initially, I was a bit put off by the spirituality retreat, because as you've heard from me in the past, I tend to be kind of a left brain <laughs> rationalist humanist. I view the world from what for me is a logical approach. As a humanist, I eschew the idea of a spiritual realm, a realm that we cannot prove scientifically. At the same time, I was at a point in my life when I was looking for something more, something deeper, so I decided to go to the retreat. For two and a half days, we sat in sacred circle, we danced, we chanted, we talked. I even participated in my first sweat lodge in the middle of January in northern Illinois, if you get my drift. The retreat, the retreat was a wonderful, life-changing experience. It was one of those times that are indelibly etched in my mind and my psyche. Interestingly, the most profound aspect of the weekend happened after it was over. I had driven to the retreat with my friend who was one of the co-facilitators, and at the conclusion of the retreat, the three leaders had spent some time debriefing themselves, and so I had to wait for my ride back. I went into the room where we had spent most of the retreat weekend and was struck by a palpable sense of the energy that was left in the room. It was something that, in the words of Doug Muter, fell in that gap between what I could experience and what I could describe. Perhaps it was the residue of the spirit of the men in that room who had spent so much intentional and meaningful time together. Now, this story might be like fingernails on a chalkboard for some of you. Many of us have real problems with the idea of spirituality. The humanists and rationalists among us may have many of the feelings that I described in myself. In the Unitarian Universalist World article that I read from earlier, Doug Muter talks about the discussion group on spirituality. Now, that's an oxymoron if I ever heard one. And the fact that they couldn't come up with a dictionary definition that was agreeable for everyone. And so, according again to Muter, the conversation never recovered. I've run into that same problem when I've tried to preach on spirituality in the past, and I have attempted it a few other times. Because spirituality for me has an I know it when I see it, kind of aspect that makes it hard for me to describe or put into words. The best way to understand or comprehend spirituality is to experience it. Whether it's found in meditation or prayer, music or exercise, wilderness canoeing, looking at the ocean at sunrise or sunset, there are those experiences in our lives that take us to the place between experience and description. The Sufi poet Kabir puts it this way, are you looking for me? I am in the next seat. My shoulder is against yours. You will not find me in stupas, not in Indian shrine rooms, nor in synagogues, nor in cathedrals, not in masses, nor kirtans, not in legs winding around your own neck, nor in eating nothing but vegetables. When you really look for me, you will see me instantly. You will find me in the tiniest house of time. Kabir says, student, tell me, what is God? God is the breath inside the breath. As Muter points out, often spirituality is found in ordinary life day experiences. It may be in the thunderstorms, the sunrise and the sunsets, snowstorms even, and the time we spend with our friends and our family. It is not the experience itself that is necessarily spiritual, but rather how we encounter that experience. It is our openness to finding meaning and enlightenment from the experience that makes it spiritual. Now at some time in our lives, many of us will endeavor to engage in an intentional spiritual practice. I know, I've tried it a number of times. And there's nothing wrong with doing so. Meditation and prayer, for example, can provide us with opportunities to empty our minds of all the detritus of our busy modern lives and concentrate on the few essentials. 
By disciplining ourselves to spend a few minutes each day in such contemplation, we might find God or the spirit that is the breath inside the breath. But Muter reminds us that we also need to find the transcendent in the ordinary. Too often we can fall into the trap that Mark Twain describes, where the events of our ordinary lives have meaning only in their utility. If we look at a giant redwood and see only board feet of timber, if we look at a vacant parcel of real estate and see only the possibilities of farming or development, if we see people as only producers or consumers, then we diminish life and the world in which we live. Seen in this light, our entire life is a spiritual practice. But then if that's the case, why do we come together as religious communities? If our entire life should be a spiritual practice, why set aside a particular time to come to a particular place with particular people to engage in a spiritual enterprise? Faith Formation 2000, 2000, 20, 2020, a study of the vitality of spiritual communities, identifies the growth of being becoming more spiritual and less religious as one of the trends impacting participation in religious organizations. The report points out that those who identify them as spiritual but not religious, while still a minority in the United States, represent a fast-growing group, particularly among those in the 18 to 39 age group, which is 18% uh, of those who are spiritual not religious today compared to 11% a decade ago. The report concludes that there's a growing group who are interested in spiritual matters but, those, but who are not interested in organized religion and whose spiritual inclinations will not lead them to become members of churches or synagogues or mosques in the future. A whole group out there who have spiritual interests but don't want to be part of a religious community. Certainly we see this in our trend in our Unitarian Universalist ranks. Many Unitarian Universalists are extremely uncomfortable in describing ourselves as a, quote, religious movement, or describing themselves as religious. And this comes from different ends of the spectrum. Both humanists and those who would classify themselves in the spiritual but not religious category would decry the word religion, never mind organized religion, to describe Unitarian Universalism. Now, before I go on, let me explain what I mean by religion for purposes of this conversation. In the West in general, and in the United States in particular, religion has been conflated with the monotheistic religions of the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. When you read discussions of religion in America, the focus is primarily on these faiths, even though Buddhism and Hinduism are rapidly growing in this country and in the West in general. Thus, whenever we see a discussion of religion, you can read between the lines that what is really being referred to is evidencing a faith in a supreme being, read the God of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, and possibly the Quran. A humanistic, non-theistic religion, for example, is not even on the radar screen in most of these discussions. So why is it that some react with such passion against the use of the term religion? The reasons are legion. For many, it is the product of a personal, hurtful experience with religion at some earlier point in their lives. Some have come out of a fundamentalist childhood experience of religious beliefs that uses fear and shame to compel obedience. If the individuals are gay or lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, the very teachings of the faith tell them that they cannot be accepted as who they are and in some cases are told that God, in fact, hates them. At a minimum, LGBT persons cannot openly be themselves in their religious community. These experiences have taught them that religious community is a place where they are not accepted and where the value of their lives is not affirmed. And having had only this experience of religion, they do not really realize that there's another one. Also, too often religion tends to connote creeds and doctrine and dogmas. The original simple story of the founders of the religion often become tied up in doctrinal nuances 
succeeding, by succeeding generations of believers. The original <laughs> ideas become enmeshed in disputes over minor points of dogma. For many, the focus on these distinctions seems like a lot of hot air expended over the meaninglessness, and it drives them away. For others, the rejection of religion involves a broader indictment. Recent bestsellers by Sam Harris, The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason, the late Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great, and Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, provide a blanket denunciation of religion, especially of the Western theistic Abrahamic variety. For these writers, religion has little, if any, good to offer. And they have a point. If we look to history, we can see many reasons to reject any notion <laughs> of religion. Countless wars over the course of human history have had an explicitly religious basis. Particularly with the advent of Christianity and Islam in the first millennium of the Common Era, and the Protestant Reformation and the ensuing conflict between Protestant and Catholic Christians, Wars with religious undertones have been a constant feature of the historical landscape. In the 20th and 21st centuries, there have been wars, civil wars, and interminable violent conflicts grounded in religious difference. Much violence has been done in the name of the Prince of Peace and the Prophet. Religious beliefs have been problematic on other fronts as well. Over the centuries, there's been the well-documented conflict between religion and science. The Christian church tried to silence Galileo when he dis discovered and, and demonstrated that the earth was not the center of the universe, but only a pa small part of the great <laughs> galactic cosmos. Since publication of The Origin of Species, the work of Charles Darwin has been the center of disputes involving the biblical accounts of creation and what should be taught to our school children about where we come from. These, those fights continue to this day. Their ongoing political disagreements, often religiously motivated, over the propriety of embryonic stem cell research. There are political disputes on the emotionally charged issues, theological issues, of when life begins. Questions of the rights and roles of women in society have religious underpinnings. Many churches are the last bastions of patriarchy and the denial of equal rights to women. Religious doctrine and scriptural interpretation has been used to deny equal rights to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered persons and to justify the persecution and, in some cases, their murder. We have the spectacle today of some fundamentalist groups in the United States supporting attempts in Uganda and other countries to make homosexuality a capital crime. There are even conservative religious groups making common cause with Russian Vladimir Putin, a former KGB agent, in persecuting LGBT persons. Also, as Christopher Hitchin pointed out, one of the problems with some religion is that it's not content to impose its doctrines on its own adherents. Rather, it feels obligated to impose its views on others, whether they like it or not. The so-called Great Commission commanding Christians to therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, has been taken as a license to impose Christianity on all, whether they want it or not. Similar injunctions in the Quran has had similar results. And this has resulted not only in the forced conversion of non-believers, but also attempts to impose religious law, whether the Ten Commandments or Sharia, on secular society. Thus, religion, in certain of its manifestations, certainly has much to answer for. Spirituality, on the other hand, seems to impact only the individual practitioner and does not seem to directly or adversely affect the wider world. In fact, there are those who argue that spirituality can have a positive impact on the world by making the spiritual person more aware of her or his need to be compassionate to all of the creation. Muter suggests that the value of spirituality is that when we stare into the gap between experience and description, something will crystallize for us and become describable for the first time. This allows us to discover new ideas that we can then use in our mission to the world. 
In Spirituality for the Skeptic, Robert C. Solomon argues that, quote, spirituality is ultimately social and global, a sense of ourselves identified with others in the world. It transforms us and makes us more able to have an impact on who we are and what we do in the world. The Buddhist teacher and practitioner Thich Nhat Hanh promotes the spiritual practice of mindfulness that focuses in part on what he calls interbeing, the interconnected of all existence, the web perhaps. This understanding of the interconnectedness to all beings allows one to translate spiritual practice, mindfulness meditation, in a way to, to practically serve the world. So if indeed religion has all this baggage and being spiritual appears, appears to be a better way to engage the world, why do I say that I'm religious and not spiritual? Well, obviously one reason was to come up with a catchy sermon title. That's always useful for the newsletter. But it's more than that. In my mind, the problem with being only spiritual is that there's a tendency to focus on the inner life and not to engage with the wider world. Even though there can be a sense of community among spiritual practitioners, this does not always translate into broader action. I'm sure you've heard many times that the Latin root of the word religion or religious is religio, to bind together. Religion is at its best the creation of a community aimed towards a common goal. The religious community provides a place for persons with some common set of values to come together to support one another and to work together to serve the broader community. The distinction that's often made between secular and religious humanism, for example, is that secular humanism tends to be more individualistic, while religious humanists come together in some sort of community. Also, religious humanists are more open to the sense of ritual and spirituality though many re religious humanists might be put off by the use of the word spiritual, even in the humanistic sense. Whether these communities come together in the name of God or Jesus or, Mar or Muhammad, the Buddha or Krishna, or in the name of humanistic or natural spiritual values, at best they call on people to live up to their better selves, to be better persons. A religious community has other characteristics and values as well. Religious, religious communities provide a place to engage in spiritual practices and rituals that can be allow us to connect with what is better than ourselves, however we choose to imagine or name that. It is also a supportive community that is there to rejoice with us in times that are good and console us in times of sorrow. It is there to mark the passages of our lives, the dedication of our children, the sacred union for those committing themselves to a lifetime intimate partnership, transitions from youth to adulthood, remembering the life well lived for those who have died. The religious community also provides a home base for going out into the world to promote our values of justice and compassion. While as religious liberals we don't promote any particular creed, and in fact we may not share a common theology, we do, I believe, share a sense of the need to make this a more just and equitable community. And it is this shared sense of values that gives us the strength to continue in the face of adversity. I'm sure some of you have experienced this with me. I left organized religion in my 20s because I was no longer able to accept the beliefs of my childhood. I was away for over 20 years. And what brought me back was not just that I found in Unitarian Universalism, a faith that satisfied me intellectually or whose beliefs I shared. These were important. But what I really had missed in the 20 years was that special sort of community that is found in religious community. I'm sure that if my personal beliefs had tended in a more conventional or conservative direction, I would still have been looking for the same thing, simply in a different venue. So am I spiritual or religious? Now this may seem like a cop-out, but at this point of my life, I have to say both and. As I get older and reflect more on my life, I am probably becoming more spiritual. I'm more open to the mystery of life and the notion that we are part of something greater. I would not define this as God in the traditional sense, but simply a sense of moreness, whatever that may turn out to be. At the same time, I have become more convinced than ever of the need for involved, 
engaged religious communities to challenge the current culture of self-gratification and the I've got mine, you go fend for yourself morality that has gained greater concern, currency in our public discourse. As I become older, I think more about what kind of a world I'll leave to my grandchildren and their grandchildren. And I see a religious community as one way to promote those values which are important to me and which I may see as the one way that this world can be saved. So I would suggest a new Unitarian Universalist Great Commission. Go into the world and spread a message of love and justice for all who dwell in it. So may it be. Let's take a few minutes for a conversation. We're running a little short of time this morning, but anybody got any thoughts? Yeah. It, it, uh, I don't think it can be disputed that uh, religion, more bloodshed, more blood has been shed in the name of organized religion than any other thing on this planet, and uh, at which is uh, a perversion of the, uh, as you mentioned, religio, the Greek orig origin of the word, which was to bind together, as you said. Uh, but uh, to me, spirituality is, uh, I consider myself very spiritual in that uh, spirit or soul is, is considered, and I know it to be the seat of spirit, and I also know heart to be the seat of soul. So when I think somebody asks me, what do you mean by spirituality? And I just simply say uh, anything that is truly heartfelt. Because you can feel it in your heart when you are doing the right thing, when you are doing the spiritual thing. You can feel it in your chest. Yeah. And it's quite amazing. Yeah. Others with thoughts. Yeah. <clears throat> well, my one prayer is that I will never become so tethered to the mundane aspects of life that I will fail to experience the ecstasy of simply being alive. It's a good way to put it. Others? Um, you spoke of the spirituality you felt in that room after your mm -hmm. uh, retreat. Um, I had a similar experience, not in a room, but on my last visit <clears throat> to England, uh, I went with my sister to a sort of nostalgic trip to Yorkshire where we grew up, which is the northeast. And in Yorkshire there are a number of abbeys that were um, pulled apart by Henry VIII at the dissolution of the monasteries. And we visited Revo, which is one of those abbeys. And I just stood there. It gets me choked to be thinking about it now. But um, four or five hundred years ago, there were 800 monks living in this place. And it's just these tall ruins standing out in, in, in the Yorkshire countryside. And it's wild and it's beautiful. And we came around a corner and there was a dead bird, a beautiful I don't know what kind of a bird it was, but it obviously flown into something and broken its neck. And somebody had laid it very gently on the grass and put next to it a little cross made out of re reeds just lying there. And afterwards, when I came back to the United States, I found a quote from D.H. Lawrence about the sacred places in the world when there were wolves in the street of Rome in the dark ages, <coughs> where little groups of people kept the human, human spirit alive. And Revo was one of those places. And just take a look at it on the internet. They've got pictures of the place, but the feeling, and I, it, it, it just made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It was just fantastic. That was one of my big ones. Wow. Maybe one more comment over here. I read something uh, a couple of years ago. It said, the purpose of organized religion is to keep you from having an, uh, um, intimate relationship with God. 
<laughs> okay. Well, food for thought. If anybody wants to talk about it, we can continue this conversation during the